Good afternoon, everybody who's tuned in, their members. Uh, my name is Neil Evans, and I'm uh, representing uh, Norcham today in this debate. I have the great pleasure of putting nasty questions to an old friend of mine, Mr. Radek Spitzar. Welcome to the show. And Radek is, as most of you, or many of you know, the Vice President of the Confederation for Industry and Transportation. The Confederation is representing the big uh, industry in negotiations with uh, A, the trade union, and B, with the government. I would like to, you to be aware of the fact that Radek here is not representing the government, even though he is dealing with them daily and knows how and what they think, but he is by in no means responsible for what the government is doing. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had these problems before. So, uh, uh, what the, uh, all law proposals that are affecting the industry are put to the Confederation for uh, comments and approval before they are uh, uh, put to vote to the parliament, so it's a very powerful organization. Many people also mix it up with the Czech Chamber of Commerce, which is where Mr. Dlohy is responsible. But uh, the Czech Chamber represents uh, the SMEs, the small and mid-sized uh, enterprises, whereas uh, Radek and the Confederation here represent the big boys like Škoda, Pilsner, Quell, Chess, uh, Honeywell, etc. Uh, Radek's main responsibility in the chamber, in the confederation, is economy and exports. And uh, he's a busy man right now, I can assure you that. I have known Radek for uh, many years and I could tell you a lot about him. But apart from being a great scholar and a good judge of beer, he's also a TV producer of late and has a, a TV show called Kocha Neni Pes. Kochkan Eni Pes, and he has his own dog food, dog and cat food brand called Dog Swell and Cat Swell. So run out and buy. But we're not here to talk about digestive problems about cats and dogs. We are here to discuss the problem that we're all facing now. It's the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences for, for the industry, for the economy, for employers, for employees and people from all walks of life. And uh, before I hand over the first question to Radek, I would uh, like to gratulate him today on his 25th anniversary with his wife. Congratulations. Brother. Thank you very much, Niels. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, we're ready to jumpstart this show. We only have an hour and um, and I will start with something uh, which is very, uh, very current and uh, also has been a, a topic from the beginning of the, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it has to do with the, the supply chain. Uh, yesterday, when we had a short chat together, the, the trucks were uh, lined up on the borders and uh, uh, with goods from Czech subcontractors to, among other industries, the car industry in Germany, and could not fulfill their just-in-time delivery obligations. Skoda apparently had to stop on Friday for production for some time, but you know this better than me, as it's your former employer. And, uh, and uh, there was some valve from China that didn't arrive or something, and and uh, my question to you is, uh, how, do you, how does the Confederation get involved in, in solving these acute uh, supply chain problems? Niels, first of all, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's really uh, a great pleasure to see you, personally. Uh, and I really mean it because uh, you know how much I, uh, I, I love you and I've always uh, loved you, you know, for so many years that, uh, that we've known each other. So thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, this is a big issue uh, because uh, Czech Republic is, is export-oriented economy. Uh, export represents uh, you know, most 80% of our GDP, so everything we produce here we have to sell somewhere else, basically. Uh, so whenever there are problems on the borders, it has very big impact, uh, negative impact uh, on us uh, employers. 
Uh, this is not the first time it's happening, actually. Uh, the first time we faced this was at the beginning of the crisis when we closed the borders. And now it's more than a year, so I can reveal uh, what happened at that time. The government simply <coughs> uh, forgot about exporters. Uh, the politicians ordered closing of the borders, but they forgot that there are actually trucks you know, and people uh, traveling back and forth. Uh, and we had to, and it was our president uh, Jaroslav Hanak, who spent literally the whole night uh, talking to the prime minister, talking to ministers, saying you have to have some exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand why you close the borders, but there must be you know, green lines for the lorries, for the trucks, etc. People must get their food, you know, etc., uh, etc. Et so the government, uh, the next morning, uh, came up with exceptions for uh, for for the traffic. Uh, they created the green lines because uh, the, the borders were jammed, etc. So we experienced this a year ago, and now we are uh, we are experienced it again. Now it's not us closing the borders; it's it's the Germans uh, doing it because uh, of the uncontrolled pandemic and, and the pandemic situation in the Czech Republic. It's it's very unfortunate. Uh, we get uh, we get information from our members that their trucks get stuck at the borders for six, eight hours. Uh, so again, we are now talking to the government and to the German authorities, for example, through our uh, through our um, uh, ambassador in Germany about uh, some kind of system, you know, some kind of regulation at the borders because sometimes the, the trucks get stuck there because the drivers are not tested. Mm -hmm. So they must get tested on the spot, which of course takes time. So we are now <coughs> trying to inform our members to do it in advance, you know, get all the papers ready. We are talking uh, to the authorities uh, again, again about the green, uh, green lines for uh, trucks that are OK, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's back. Uh, I hoped it would never uh, be back again uh, after a year, but unfortunately it, uh, it is. Well, I hear the trucks are rolling again, so, uh, <laughs> so, I, uh, so I assume it has been solved for, for this time. What about Working Sko on it, working what, on what it. What about Skoda not getting parts from China and having to stop the production? Look, that, that, that was fascinating. At the beginning of the, of the pandemic, it was, like a, it was like a disease, you know. Uh, first, uh, the parts were not coming from China because it was China uh, which was hit the first. <coughs> then uh, China solved the issue and, and the parts started coming again. But then it was Italy, you know, Europe hit. And, and spare parts were not coming uh, to, to the OEMs in the Czech Republic. So you could really see uh, how uh, the pandemic was hitting country by country uh, mm -hmm. because uh, our, our companies had the big problems when it came to their supply chains. Now it's, it's back again. Uh, Škoda is having big, uh, big difficulties uh, at the moment. Um, just like other, other OEMs, not only in the Czech Republic, but in Europe in general. But it leads me to one important, uh, important topic, which is shortening of the, of the global supply chains. Mm -hmm. uh, I participate uh, in an in a EU debate uh, a few weeks ago about uh, more of a European sovereignty when it comes to production of certain goods, uh, services, and in certain, certain areas. And I, so first of all, I see a political debate in the EU uh, because the EU, and I think it's right, uh, is uh, now well aware that it's not good to be so dependent on China of when it so. when it comes to protective mm -hmm. masks and medicine, you know, uh, etc. And I see the same debate in the private sector, in the companies, because you know <coughs> they sent a lot of work uh, to Asia recently. Now this work can get back because of the fourth industrial revolution, digitalization, automatization, sure. robotization. And secondly, these companies are aware that uh, to have a global supply chains of, of this magnitude might be a weakness in situations like, uh, like COVID pandemic. And mm -hmm. they are thinking about shortening mm -hmm. uh, these supply chains, moving production back to Europe, which mm -hmm. I think is one of the could be one of the positive aspects of the pandemic. Uh, of course it is. We actually in the Nordic Chamber of Commerce have a working group that okay, uh, really? works Excellent. on the shortening of the, okay. of the supply chains now. So, well, anyway, that is, that is a, a, a huge problem, but probably not the biggest we're facing here. The, 
the, the yesterday the figures were 12,000 new affected yeah, and yeah. today it was 10,000 or from yesterday 10,800 yeah. and it doesn't seem to want to go anywhere anytime soon I also there is a great I would say dissatisfaction with the way the the government has been handling it, not having enough uh, vaccines, then giving out too many vaccines, not having the second doses, and uh, you know, and it's unfair distribution, etc., etc. And I uh, have read that uh, many companies are thinking of taking uh, taking this issue into their own hands and start with their own okay. vaccinations and. Uh, or buy their own vaccination and, and uh, put it in people's arms on the factories so they don't have to close down. Now this brings obviously a number of issues because you're sneed jumping the queue and that is again unfair and uh, to some people, but if nothing is happening from the official side, I guess you guys have to help the industry to get their vaccines mm -hmm. to keep on producing. Uh, let me clarify that yeah. uh, because it's an important topic and I would say it's one of the most important topics that we are dealing with uh, nowadays vis-a-vis -vis the government. First of all, testing and mm -hmm. secondly, vaccination. Mm -hmm. We've been telling the government that, that it's not testing enough for half a year. Uh, <coughs> in, uh, in spring last year, we were, we were saying, we, we, were, we were telling the government, we have to test more, look at other countries, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the... It's one of the um, one of the things you really have to do if you want to control the, the pandemic. And we were telling the government, uh, pay for the tests mm. uh, so that the employers uh, do it more mm. uh, when it comes to their, uh, their employees. And, uh, you know, Škoda Auto, Škoda Auto is employing 35,000 people. Absolutely. So, you know, if they do it properly, it can really help. But the government was probably preoccupied with other things. The good thing is that we reached the agreement now. I know it's too late, yeah, but, but uh, better late, late than never, <laughs> as we know, as we yeah. know in business. So uh, we really shook hands with uh, with Minister Blatney uh, literally a few days ago, and uh, the government should pay for for testing for the tests mm -hmm. within the companies. Mm -hmm. For companies, if if our um, if your colleagues from the chamber will be interested, it will not be super easy uh, to, to provide tests to its employees. First of all, it will be paid by the government, which is great. Mm -hmm. But secondly, they have to have their own testing uh, facility, as we know it from the street when we go for, uh, <coughs> for, for tests. If they, and, and that's relatively costly. Uh, companies will have to have it at all the spots that they operate. So if Škoda Auto has a Kvasiny uh, sure. uh, production plant, Vrchlabí production plant, Mladá Boleslav production plant, mm. It will not be enough to have it only in Mada Boleslav. Mm. Uh, companies will have to have it sure. at, at all the production production spots. And if they don't have... Uh, and they have to test 35,000 a, yeah, exactly, a day or exactly. every second day. Or and if they don't have their own doctors, Škoda has its own hospital, yeah, you know, yeah. their, their, own, their own doctors. But uh, for, for SMEs, it's not, uh, it's not possible. They will have to hire uh, well-trained people who will be actually testing, uh, testing mm. the people, helping the companies with the tests. And then... Uh, there will be a, uh, an obligation to send the, the results to national authorities, to hygiene uh, stations, so that they can monitor whether there are, there are people uh, positive or negative. And if there are, because it will be anti-gene uh, tests, mm. if there are positive, there will have to be PCR uh, tests for validation. Afterwards, yeah. But, uh, you know, as I said, uh, it's late, but mm. uh, better... Too now, little, too late, as they say. Exactly. Mm. So that, that's for the tests. Mm. And I, I believe that it will increase the number of, uh, of tests and improve the testing uh, within, within companies. Mm. So that's one thing. And second is vaccination. Uh, <coughs> we, we, we told the government, look, we are able and willing and ready to take care of our people. So let us, uh, let us into the system somehow. Mm. Uh, Again, we ne we've negotiated with the government about the possible ways how to get uh, how to get involved, and there are three stages that uh, that we will get into the system. First of all, we will help with the information campaign. I think it's uh, it's it's horrible that the the campaign is not going on. Basically, information campaign mm -hmm. because we still have. 50% of the population unwilling to get to get the vaccine mm. for various reasons. So that there must be a professional 
well-prepared information campaign about the vaccination that people don't have to be worried about it etc it, it yeah. was only approved by the government this week mm. and it will be introduced hopefully uh, <coughs> at, the end, at the end of this month so we will we will be active in this campaign mm. and we will help the government to get it out uh, through our uh, space in the, in the public media uh, within our companies within the structures of internal communication etc etc so that's the first step we will help with uh, with the information campaign concerning vaccination secondly uh, we will offer because i as you mentioned in the introduction i'm representing the big, big guys you know trinetske Železárny, chess škoda auto okd mondi etc those sure. are huge companies with thousands of employees we have our own vaccination centers uh, our our companies have their own hospitals uh, healthcare centers etc so we said we will provide the government with our uh, health centers so that ordinary people not only our employees can take their vaccine in our facilities mm -hmm. so that for example 80 year old lady uh, who lives in Mladá Boleslav doesn't have to go to Kolín to get the vaccine because Mladá Boleslav hospital is full. Absolutely. She yeah. will be able to get it in Škoda Auto vaccination, vaccination center. And that should start in May. So we made a deal with the government that our companies willing to enter the national government uh, run vaccination mm -hmm. scheme will be able to, uh, to get into it uh, at the beginning of May. And third thing which you mentioned is us taking care of uh, vaccination of our own employees disregarding uh, the state uh, vaccination campaign and unfortunately <coughs> i have to say that although our members are ready uh, many of them actually signed contracts with producers of, of vaccines i can imagine yeah. they cannot get it yeah. they cannot get it because the producers say our priority is to supply the governments mm -hmm. with uh, with whom we have the contracts and only when that is done, we can supply you as private, uh, mm. private enterprises. So uh, when we ask those companies who signed the contracts and who are willing to buy the vaccine and vaccinate their own employees, when they will, they will get it, they tell us, Radek, it's, uh, it's definitely a couple of months. It Absolutely. might be the end of the year, etc. because uh. the government ordered, you know, so many so many vaccines that uh, it will take a few months for the producers actually to uh, to fulfill their their demand yeah no that's not so good news <laughs> yeah. that we, we're looking at but we also had a, a similar debate with us with the ceo of astrazeneca oh you had astrazeneca here so you yeah, so, come on so uh, she also said you know the rollout it will take it will take the whole year before yeah and it's just pure math you know from from the approval to manufacturing to distribution yeah. to putting in people's arm to everything being safe and no mm. hiccups in the people getting sick of the vaccine etc cetera, etc cetera. it's best case it's out in you know six seven months from yeah. now so yeah. so that's not so good news and in the meantime we have to deal with uh, <laughs> what we have at yep. stake here so um, so there is, of course, uh, a lot of government support out there, various antivirus programs and COVID-1, 2, 3, COVID-PRA, now also this COVID-2021, mm. COVID-NIAM. And uh, so uh, your organization, where do they stand? What is the most important yes, yes. thing for, for, for the big industry? Mm -hmm. I think I know what it is, but uh, you can probably better explain that to us. Look, we, we all, uh, in the, in, in, on the board of the Confederation, we all remember 2008, 2009, mm. how difficult it was for the, for the Czech industry, for the Czech economy, and how uh, the government at that time did not uh, act. Mm. You know, we pushed it to, to, to adopt Kurzarbeit at that time, pushed it to adopt some kind of antivirus at that time. Didn't happen. Mm. So this time, we were ready and and we said like we will push from the very beginning and it, we, we should not uh, repeat the same mistakes as uh, as the government did uh, 10 years ago uh, or more than 10 years ago and uh, when the crisis came we immediately started 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 talking to the government about uh, Kurzarbeit mm -hmm. 
uh, because we said it will be difficult for our members, for, for Czech businesses to keep employees because uh, you know, if you shut them down, if there is no demand, uh, you know, it's unbearable uh, to keep 30,000 people you know, at, at place. And you probably, the government, don't want us to fire those people. <coughs> and we don't want to do it either you know, because we know how empty is the Czech labor market. Still, even today, uh, when we face the worst uh, econ economic crisis in our modern history, we have more open jobs than, than unemployed people. Mm. It's uh, 300,000 uh, open jobs that are available on the market and less than 300,000 uh, uh, no. 300, uh, unemployed people. See, so that's the situation on the labor market. I must, I must say, we, we are... Oh. Our business is also, we had 100 people uh, we had to put on leave and, and I must say all of them have got uh, have gotten some sort of jobs, jobs in, the, exactly. in the meantime, yes. without exception. So, yeah. so we said, let's, let's keep it like this, uh, let, let's, let's help the companies to, to keep their employees and don't send them uh, to, to unemployment. And I must say, and, and I, I say it publicly, that the government reacted very fast to that. So we started to, uh, to talk to Ministry of uh, Labor and Social Affairs very fast and they relatively fast adopted the first antivirus program, which helped our companies to keep, uh, to keep people at work and eased their situation uh, to a large extent. And I, when I ask our members, even today, a year after, what is the best working, most efficient program for us? They say antivirus. It, it was changing for, for A, B, well, you yeah. know, etc. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember I talked to, uh, to a mutual friend of ours, uh, Sanjeev. Mm. Uh, he called me and he said, the original version Radek is not working. I will not be able to keep the people at place. Mm. So even through conversations like that, mm. that I had with Sanjeev, we we told the government how to change it, how to reshape it, redesign it, so that it really help. Uh, so that it really helps not only us as the big industrial companies, mm. but also sectors mm. that are important, like gastro mm. and uh, and small and medium size. Well, it's a, it's a, you know it's fifty, eighty thousand people working in our industry yes, only exactly. in Prague, you know, and putting them yeah. all on the street. It's uh, it, it will also ruin the industry for years to come. You know, there will yeah. be no good qualified people in the whole in the whole industry which is bad however so, so and if, i'm sorry yeah. i don't finish it uh antivirus was uh, was a key for yeah. us now we are very mad at the government that they are unable to turn antivirus into real kurzarbeit yeah. uh, that would be you know uh, designed by law but it's still in the parliament if if you if you want to know how it might <coughs> work, we can get to it later mm. and second was covid uh, covid plus uh, and covid three because the COVID-1 uh, and COVID-2 was uh, not for big companies. It was only for small and medium-sized companies. Uh, also it, because it was also not for us because we were in too risky industry. So they and you were in the risky industry. So exactly. they didn't want to give it to us either. So we negotiated uh, with the government and the banks because yeah. we, we, we knew how jammed was uh, Českomoravská záručně rozvojová yeah. banka, that everything was taking month. Mm. So we said, no, we have to get uh, private banks into the game mm. and uh, that's that's how actually uh, COVID-3 and COVID plus uh, which is which goes through a gap uh, how it was created mm. and it's helping. I have to admit that uh, the demand uh, from our companies to use COVID-3 and COVID plus uh, support is lower than we expected much lower. Yeah but it's because it has so many so many things attached to it that yes. it's so difficult it's, to get. It, you and know, it's expensive. Like, yeah. Sometimes our companies tell us, you know, I talk to my banker and I can get a better loan, yeah. cheaper than this, you know, COVID-3 uh, state guaranteed uh, support. Uh, but what our companies tell us is it's good that it's, that it's available. Mm. And if our existence was threatened and unlike, unfortunately, yeah. your yeah. business, uh, the big production companies are not uh, facing bankruptcies, no. not all of them. No, oh, majority of them no. don't face bankruptcies and they say, if we faced it, then we would use it. Yeah. So it's good to have it, <coughs> but, but like a backup option rather than something cheap and, uh, and generous, you know, and, and, and great. But, you know, for our industry, we don't even get that. And it was also mm. that the problem with it, it, it was that it would 
cover a certain percentage of of the guarantee yes, of the ninety yes, percent, yes. but it would only cover thirty percent of the total amount that this one particular bank borrowed out. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. in principle, it just if everybody went bust, yes, they only yes, covered thirty yes. percent. Yes. So they go out in the press and say that we cover ninety yes. percent, and actually it's only thirty. And our bank says to me, with thirty percent, you know, we can give you a normal loan, but. It, this doesn't help at all. Niels, I was in the debate. Uh, uh, we were the ones together uh, with the banks pushing the government to be more generous, uh, to go over 30, uh, yeah, sure. but uh, the ministries didn't want to do it. Hmm. Whereas, in, for instance, in, uh, in Norway, they did it right away, hmm. right off the bat. In February last know, year, they were paying out the, one year ago, they're paying out the first, yeah. the first state guaranteed loans. And all loans were done that the uh, the same system that the banks had to cover 10%. So they mm. were controlling the yeah. loans and it wasn't just handed out left, yeah. right and center and open I'm, up to a lot of, a uh, lot of schwindel and criminality. I've been thinking about uh, the reasons why we've been acting so differently from Switzerland, Germany, Norway uh, for a long time. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, I see two that I consider really important. First of all, we criticized the government before the crisis for creating a budget deficit. Remember, before the crisis, we grew like crazy for Absolutely. several years, yeah. for several years. Mm. Germany was creating budget surpluses. We were creating budget deficits. Mm. And at that time, I was, I was telling to, uh, to Minister of, uh, of Finance on TV, I was telling her before the pandemic, don't do it, like save money. You never know what can come and mm. we will need money mm. uh, if something happens. I had no idea that, that a pandemic might come, but uh, simply we don't have enough resources. Germany, they saved a lot of money because they really used uh, the economic growth, uh, saved a lot of money. Now ca they can be more generous. We are having at the moment a uh, half a billion deficit, you know, which, mm. is, which is a huge number. And secondly, there's a mistrust uh, on the side of the, of the state officials vis-a-vis -vis companies mm. because uh, they, they see us as cheaters, you know, Absolutely. They, and, yeah. and, and I don't like it because mm. uh, probably there are, well, probably, for sure there are cheaters, you know. If uh, the opportunity, but not opportunity makes thief, you know, so if they, they have to offer really solid systems that you cannot easily cheat, you know, that, that is... I know, but I, I believe that majority of businessmen are, are honest. You know, oh. there is a minority of, of crooks, that's for sure. But uh, you should not treat majority of, of businessmen as, no, oh, as, of as crooks. Yeah. Yeah. So is there like uh, like if we go back to Scandinavia and and uh, there is this sort of Kurzarbeit uh, already implemented in the law a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, if you right now that when it's declared a crisis, you only have to pay for the employee two days and you can, if you promise to take them back in six months, the state will take care of, of their basic salary mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for that period of time. And, and it just goes like you just turn it on and everything is in place. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like uh, the Czech uh, government needed a crisis to get Yes. to first get these systems you yes. you don't build an alarm before the burglars have been yeah. there you know yeah. so it's so Absolutely. it's uh, that's that's how we function in this yeah. country yeah but it's i think it's every country and and i think that these older economies they've been through crisis before and they yeah. know how to deal with it it is also another story on your first point that i would like to add that this is still a quite young economy it is and that means it's quite young companies yes and that means that they haven't had the time yes they have been expanding and yes. trying to to fix their feet on the ground yeah. and become a Absolutely good right. business and they don't have the resources yes. to save money for a for a accumulate capital that, yeah, and they haven't and had time yet yeah. because it's it's a lot of startups here and and you see Czech Republic compared to all these other countries is a is a economic miracle. So, so there's there's good and bad news out there. But um, 
So to comment on that, yeah. first of all, I, I totally agree with you. The accumulation of capital takes decades, mm. you know, and we are a young economy. Mm. Yeah, you are absolutely right. And secondly, we, we've, we've been telling the government, you know, anti-virus program is ad hoc anti-crisis program. We need Kurzarbeit, you know, mm. uh, done uh, by law whenever there are certain criteria fulfilled because crisis uh, is at place. It will be automatically, uh, automatically used. Uh, the government prepared, prepared it, uh, Kurzarbeit law, uh, it messed it up. Uh, mm. When we invited Babish to our uh, General Assembly at the, uh, in, <coughs> in Brno, uh, at the Brno uh, Industrial Fair, he admitted, we messed it up, we have to rewrite it. Mm. Uh, they send it to the, to the parliament, it's there, it's, uh, it's getting to an end. Uh, of the negotiations, and I wish I could tell you the final, uh, the final form, mm. but it's not, uh, it's not a proof yet. Mm. But we hope that it will be uh, a legislative, uh, a legislative uh, proposal which is automatic. So once the criteria for a crisis are fulfilled, disrespecting what the government thinks that it's necessary it or not. It just clicks in. It, it just clicks in, mm. like in Germany mm. and, and elsewhere, oh, as, oh. You, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, secondly, uh, there will be, we want it more, but I think it will be 70%, 70% coverage of the, uh, of the personal costs. Yeah. The government wanted uh, to, to... But it's 70% but it's of the days they are off, right? And this is for companies that are still open, so they're yeah. running one, two days that the, that the yes. employer has to pay full. And then let's, for instance, say three days, they get 70%, right? Now it's 60, Yeah. Right? yeah. So we will see, we so will try to influence it, but uh, I, I got your point. So, so it's still the employer has to pay half, yeah. but that is if he's operating, so yeah. maybe Eight. half is good enough. 80% uh, will be possible to send, uh, send them out, uh, mm -hmm. not working, 20% mm -hmm. work, 80% out. And uh, there will be a cap uh, worth 1.5 average uh, salary in the Czech Republic. We again <coughs> want it higher, but uh, the government said no, it would be too expensive, etc. So the what, cap what do you mean be, one and a half salary? Uh, one and a half uh, average salary. So uh, will be will be the cap. So you cannot uh, you cannot pay more to your uh, to your employee. It will only be one and a half oh, okay, uh, okay, yeah, average yeah, salary, yeah, sure, sure. which is changing every, every year, etc., yeah, etc. Et we wanted more because we wanted it to be more attractive to uh, to high wages. You mm. know. Uh, but the government said no, no, no. It will be too costly, etc. So it's in the parliament. We are still negotiating with the with the deputies about the final form. Hopefully, it will be it will be soon adopted, and uh, with criteria that that make sense. Now I have a little bit off on a tangent questionnaire. There was there's always been in newspapers there's been this reference to the EU money, and that uh, for instance that uh, the antivirus program can only run for one year because of EU restrictions, yes. and has that got to do with the the, that we're getting the money from the EU or that the EU actually is putting in restrictions? Uh, one question. The second is, there was some EU money in the beginning. How is it, who's paying, picking up the tab now? Is it the state? And, okay. and There is a very strict rule on state aid in the EU. Sure. So the governments uh, across the EU cannot support uh, their companies without, uh, without any regulation. The regulation is very strict. Mm -hmm. Uh, therefore, it was necessary to ease uh, this regulation concerning state aid on the EU level <coughs> so that the Czech government can support directly you, our companies, sure. yeah. through the anti-crisis programs. Mm. So the Czech government was uh, absolutely right. And we, for example, uh, told the government uh, COVID uh, plus and COVID three is okay. It's working for us. Our companies are happy to have it. But the government original thought that uh, we will only need it until the end of last year. Mm. We said no, like 2021 will be a difficult year. Mm. We need uh, you to continue with these support schemes, antivirus, COVID programs, etc. But for that, they needed to renegotiate uh, the easing of the state aid with the EU. Really, and it uh, always takes months, you know. So mm. we were telling the government in the middle of last year, 
start negotiating the prolongation now. Mm -hmm. Because if you start, as the government always does, in mid-December, there will be a gap period you know, without any state aid uh, that is negotiated and approved by the, by the EU. So fortunately, they did it. And uh, it was a smooth transition, you know, from yeah, no, 2020 was, was, yeah. to 2000, uh, 2021. And what's what's now available is the new uh, Národní, Národní plán obnovy. I don't know what, <coughs> it's, what it's called uh, in English, but... Uh, national plan something, yeah. Yeah, National, Re national Recovery Plan. Uh, national uh, recovery. The EU met last year. Uh, they agreed to get a loan as an EU and distribute a lot of money across all the member states mm -hmm. so that they can uh, get faster uh, and cheaper out of the crisis. So mm -hmm. we are now working with the government on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we are unhappy with the first draft that the government sent mm -hmm. to Brussels because it doesn't provide enough money for education, for digitalization of the companies, uh, etc., etc. So we are now in a in a small fight with the government over this national recovery plan. But uh, hopefully that will be another huge amount of money which should come uh, relatively soon to the Czech Republic and uh, could be used by companies to get out of the crisis uh, faster. So now now the government has spent, what, three, four hundred billion so Some, far? Exactly. Yeah, Some, yeah, somewhere yeah, in that yeah, region. Like that, yes. So. I see on our company, we can be afford maybe to be closed for another three, four months. And then okay. then uh, I would say the shit mm -hmm. will hit the fan. Okay. How, what's the staying power of the government? How long can they, they support the antivirus systems, everything as long? When, when does it come to a halt and say, sorry, we can't do this anymore? Is there any, any plan on that? Any worst case scenario? what happens if thing that's on, a good question that's issues. a good question invite them and, and and ask them whether they whether they have a plan but uh, i think they have to continue you know yeah, uh, yeah, no, well. look when i when when i talk to our uh, member companies <coughs> we are not closed production companies are not closed it's also because we are testing we have the the smart hygiene implemented Škoda auto uh, has 82 anti-pandemic measures at place. Oh, wow. uh, we didn't uh, relieve uh, all the measures uh, during uh, summer like the government did in the Czech Republic. So we can control the situation in our companies. Uh, but we are not closed. When, uh, when I look at, the, at, at your business, you know, those stories that I hear are, are really sad. And, uh, uh, and it, it really, because I know what it, what it takes. Uh, to build a business in the mm. Czech Republic, in this business climate that, that we live in. It really makes me sad. When well, I, when it, I, it's not worse here than anywhere else, I think, but it's, uh, it's taking... Uh, I know, so to, to, uh, to answer your, your question, like if the government keeps businesses closed, they must help them. Mm. And, I, and we will be pushing. And if it takes another year, because the government is slow on vaccination, Mm. You know, they must they must prolong uh, the anti-crisis measures. You mm. know, that, that at least that's my policy. And I hope that I will be able to persuade my colleagues on the board that this is uh, something we should push for as a, as a confederation. Now, a, a lot of lot of things have, have changed. You know, people's behavior, they buy maybe a little bit more conservative. They don't travel so much. They don't do this as much, They, etc. And now, you know, we are being or companies are being upheld by antivirus and other COVID-19 and mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. other support systems from the government. Now, when this stops, mm -hmm. right, so then everybody's coming out there hoping for great business mm -hmm. and it's not great. Why do you think so? Because I think it can happen because people have changed their habits and they still cannot travel freely. They still they still may be afraid of the virus. There's a lot of things. But what, I, what I'm asking you is, now it's a 3.5% uh, uh, unemployment, which is amazing, it you is. know, considering the situation. And as you mentioned before, which I did not know, that there is, a, there is More that free, amount free of jobs. There is a, that amount jobs available. Yeah. So, and then it's, it's also the number of bankruptcies that will come uh -huh. after uh -huh. the support system okay. ceases to exist. And I saw now in January, it was the highest bankruptcy rate since uh, since 92 or 93 uh -huh. or something. And 
I have a feeling that when we open up and we don't get the life injections anymore and the economy starts a little bit slower than we were hoping for, I think it can be a huge problem. That's that's interesting but, but to it, hear. But it, but I, I don't know what what is the what's the expectations of of your industries? What do what do they think that it's just virus gone? Hallelujah and more positive. We start again. Yeah. More positive, I have to say, because uh, this might be a big difference uh, if you compare it to the world economic crisis in two in two thousand eight. That was really economic crisis as we know it. You know, banks co uh, collapsing. Uh, companies uh, struggling with cash, uh, banks uh, not providing loans, you know, etc. That was yeah, but this can happen if the when the life support system not is so much, off. Niels, not so much. Ma look at the banks. I, look asking, at the banks. I'm asking. You're not asking. I'm okay, asking. okay, okay. No, this is a conversation. This is not a Q and A. This is a conversation uh, because I treat you, you know, uh, as a, no, as a businessman joking. and I'm just uh, joking with you. and an insider. Yeah. Uh, so we are more positive. Mm. We think that uh, what we are facing is not an economic crisis. Mm. Banks are okay. Our companies are okay when it comes to their cash flow. Mo most of them. So we hope that when it's over, we are vaccinated, virus is, is gone. There will be enough, enough demand. The companies uh, will be buying cars to their fleets. Uh, people will be buying goods, uh, etc., etc. So we are, we are more optimistic. And actually, in our, but, in, but in our forecast, but we say the, the industry will grow this year. I hope you're right. But there must be, there must be there is going 400 billion out now, maybe another 400 billion before this party yeah, is over. Yeah. Somebody's got to pay it. That's, that's, now, that's a that different story. Can, that can only come through state income and state income can come through growth or taxes. So now over the next, this is like an insurance company, you know, you pay the insurance, but then you increase the, then you increase the premium to, to pay for what you, for the damage. So that is what I fear. And if the taxes increase, that means that people have less to spend and then the whole evil circle starts to rotate at an ever increasing speed, in my opinion. But I hope I'm wrong. You forgot one thing and that's cuts and savings in um, the budget. Mm. Uh, so you have three possibilities. Uh, grow, <coughs> growing economy, mm. generating enough profit to pay back the debt. Cuts and savings in the budget, uh, operational costs of the ministries, you know, stuff like that. Reforms, you know, uh, so that you don't have to... Have I've never seen that happen in no, ex ex country, that, but uh, I'm about <laughs> to say that later on. <laughs> or increase of taxes. Uh -huh. And of course, uh, I, and I will start there. I've never seen, you know, uh, cuts, cuts and savings uh, so efficient that the, that would be the that would be the solution. Growing economy, we'll see how much we are able to to recover and grow. I we are optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, our our foresight for the industry is uh, two percent growth this mm -hmm. year. Uh, last year it was minus uh, five point six, so we think we will grow this year, but it will probably not be enough. So the third option, increase of, uh, of taxes, is a real option. And uh, <coughs> I, was, I was actually asked uh, by a number of political parties getting ready for the, for the elections if I could uh, talk to them about the, the current state of the economy and if I could comment on their uh, visions uh, for the Czech economy if they take power after the elections. Absolutely. And I will not uh, name them directly, but in many of their election proposals and economic strategies that they are ready to implement if they get power, increase of corporate tax is an option. Yeah. So I was saying, oh, guys, you know, be careful, you know, but, uh, but, but uh, let's, they consider it. Let, let's say, let's say, what, what would you think is, is the best tax to increase? You can do. You can do. No, no, I will not get. Tax, no, 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 corporate tax, no, 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 no. VAT. I will, no, I will not get into it because I will fight against uh, the increase of, of taxes in general okay. with with the with the following argument. Okay. Tell me what's working well in this country. Do we have uh, enough people on the labor market? No, we don't. Uh, do we have fast uh, construction permits? No, we don't. Uh, do we change legislation uh, seldom? No, we, we we change it every year, and it's crazy. <coughs> taxation is bearable and it's one of the last Absolutely. comparative advantages mm -hmm. that we have 
vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And it must stay like this. If we are Norway, if we are Scandinavia, great schools, great infrastructure, uh, law enforcement, fantastic, no corruption, uh, construction permits, okay, then let's talk about increase, uh, increased taxes, mm. but not vice versa. Mm. Well, I hope you're right that the taxes will <laughs> well, increase. Yeah. But Any, anyway, well, I won't make, be making money for a long time, so I'm not so worried about taxes <laughs> in the yeah. intermediate or immediate term. So, so, um, and then uh, we, I think we covered the ground now with the pandemic. Then it's we're looking into the future, and you know, we in the Nordic Chamber of Commerce, we we uh, we represent the values, obviously, of the. Nordic countries and uh, we are we have a very human approach mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. that everybody is supposed to be happy and uh, and uh, we call it with the big word the, sustain the sustainability of the mm -hmm. companies you know and uh, this is great. and there is there is uh, we work on a lot of uh, sustainability issues like we, we talked about the supply chain but mm -hmm. we also have healthy living and the workplace and uh, and various other projects that we have uh, going, and um, and I was just thinking now, when you are in midst of all this mess with the pandemic and all the small problems and the, where do your kind of sustainable goals stand now? You know, like gender, race, equality, uh, supply chain, circular economy. You know. Uh, yep. uh, clean, uh, renewable energy, etc., etc. Is it, uh, is it uh, like dropped like a hot potato right now and okay. just focus okay. on thing in hand? Or is it still kind of looking ahead for, for to, with full force still yeah. to, to achieve the goals that I'm sure you have, you have uh, set for your industries? That's a really good question. And uh, the, the, the answer will be, will be complicated mm. because it's both. Uh, there are companies struggling uh, and for them uh, to, to start talking about uh, CO2 neutrality, uh, gender diversity and stuff, it's like radic. Yeah. Uh, come on. Like, come back next year. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so for a lot of companies it is like that. Mm. For many others it's the other way around. They are mm. saying we are in a crisis. Mm. And actually, this might help digitalization, automatization, uh, uh, energy saving, uh, you know, is, is an issue. And we see it now, how much of a burden it is if, mm. if we don't deal with it much clearer, clearer <coughs> much more clear than, uh, than we saw it before the crisis. Yeah, it's true, it's true. So that's why, you know, how EU optimistic I am. Yeah, yeah. But I really think that this, uh, that this plan to use the crisis for a quality step when it comes to transforming the economy in this direction. Mm. Uh, uh, sustainable development, development goals is a good strategy. Mm. I, I really think so. Mm. But as I said, companies are struggling, they need money. Of so course. the government must support them and the EU money must come for, for, these, uh, for these initiatives. And the companies must decide what, what are we talking about amounts for this eu 180 billion crowns oh, okay. which is a lot which is a lot of money, it's a lot uh, of money. and it, it should go into digitalization mm. into uh, uh, into energy savings mm. uh, better development of uh, of uh, regions with uh, with a lot of pollution you know etc so mm. i i really believe it, it might sound na naive but I really believe that we can uh, we can solve the crisis and get out of it stronger uh, if we have this if we have this strategy because uh, Josef Schumpeter, uh, a great thinker and yeah, economist, yeah. you know, he he came from Czechoslovakia <coughs> and this uh, the concept of creative destruction is something we can we can use a lot of a lot of businesses a lot of. Uh, business uh, business models will not survive of course yeah. but uh, something better might uh, might come out of the of the crisis and this is it you know less uh, less uh, energy uh, consumption more uh, energy efficient uh, solutions in the in the industry 
uh, better management of CO2 emissions, etc. I, I really believe we can use the crisis in this in a positive way. Very good. Now I want to get back to a little bit to the labor code. And it's, uh, you know, right now you have, uh, you have three months notice mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. have uh, three months uh, remuneration payment. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you want to get rid of somebody, crisis or not crisis, it costs the employer six months uh, salary if you want him to leave. Now, if this doesn't ease up, how do you think that the future workplace would look? Will it, you know, the much talked about gig economy when people work on a gig, they work on three months and then they have to they drop and then do you think that the workforce will be have a lot to be afraid of in the future and and that it will be so flexible that people will be scared and uncomfortable with that situation? Or do you think that the old model with the, you know, once you are employed, you will you will stay employed for mm -hmm. as long as you don't come out, show up uh, late and Niels, under for, for, for both day. of us as employers, mm -hmm. uh, both of us can definitely imagine more flexible labor code, mm -hmm. that's for sure. But when I ask our members, uh, really doing those who do business uh, all across Europe or even globally, they say your labor market and your lab labor code is not the worst we've seen. It could be much worse. And they, they are giving examples uh, from France, you know. Uh, France is horrible. Exactly. But that's it, almost cost them exactly. the whole economy. In some respect to Germany, yeah. which, is Germany not, uh, also, yeah. which is not as flexible you know, as it, uh, as it should be. But they have automated so much and know, digitalized know, know, so much, so they're compensated on that. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that our members don't tell us that this is something we have to focus mm. on and something we have to change. Yeah. Uh, they want specific modifications, exactly, be, be, uh, policies when it comes to the crisis. That's why we lobby so much for the Kurzarbeit, etc. Mm. But they don't say we have to redesign uh, the labor code from the scratch because okay. it's, uh, it's complicating. Just the, me who wants that, okay. The, the situation. <laughs> and uh, you, you asked about uh, the outlook uh, and, and the threats in the future. Where I see them is, uh, is the fourth <coughs> industrial revolution because we are the most industrialized economy in the EU. Uh, we are an industrial superpower. Industry represents more than 30%, 30% of our GDP. It's, it's more than Germany. And uh, we, as, uh, as industrial companies, we employ a lot of people and we give them physically difficult, uh, demanding work. Uh, they are not well paid mm. and uh, they have almost no skills. Mm -hmm. These jobs, will disappear. And in the Czech Republic, we are talking about half a million jobs easily in mm. the industry. So what's ahead of us is we have to, rip, we have to get rid of these, these jobs. People will lose work if, if it's them mm. working in these, uh, in these jobs. But the, the, the digitalization, robotization, automatization, because it, it will increase the productivity so much, it will create even more jobs. But if these people who lost their stupid jobs will want to take them, we will have to upskill them. We mm. will have to requalify them. So the people will have to be willing to, to get more knowledge, more expertise. Will be, we will have to be willing to change themselves. And we are ready to help them with it because we will need people. We are missing people, as we, as we said. Mm. But it will be difficult. So this, this uh, upskilling will be a big issue. Yeah, but I think that upscaling is, in itself is not such a big problem. I, I, uh. I can, but you will see, like for instance, Austria, they, they were all waiters and, and now there's, there's no waiters anymore. There were millions of waiters, uh -huh. like working in gastro industry. And they, that's all foreign and now they've all been upscaled. Okay. In Norway, we, we were a big sailor nation, we were a shipping nation, it mm -hmm. used to be used to be 20% of our uh, GDP in the old days. And, you know, every second guy was a sailor in the 50s. I'm exaggerating. I don't remember exactly. We had, a, you know, the Siemens University and this and that uh -huh. to become a captain and machine chief and everything. There's not a sailor left. Uh -huh. The whole university shut down. There's a lot of uh, Norwegian boats out there, but it's filled with Philippines and Indians mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people from all over the world. And I just, I just said, what happened to those sailors? Where, where are they? 
but they must have upscaled because there's no unemployment. Okay. So they must have upscaled or trained or gone into other jobs, whether that is as a truck driver or as the economy grows, there it okay. grows also. Also, other services are are more needed. I think so. I, so in this I in this case, you so are afraid. more optimistic. I'm also, more given optimistic. your experience yeah. with an economy yeah. that has a longer tradition mm. than our yeah. young thirty yeah. years economy. Okay, but we will we will see what what happens. Could be. So, so um, I have a question from a friend there, and it's a uh, it's a uh, little bit complicated, but I'll read it to you. Because I know you're an EU friend and also a friend of the Euro. So here, according to Bloomberg, since 2015, the ECB has bought 3 trillion euro worth of European government bonds and is now owing 40% of the uh, market. That keeps the uh, rates obviously artificially low because nobody else wants to buy these bonds. and. And uh, the European Union cannot stop to buy these bonds either to finance these uh, countries that are in a worse situation. So what is your view on the v euro in it, this situation? Maybe it's a question of the, of the market. What, and what do you think will happen with the interest rates? No, it's a it's a good it's a good question, and although I consider myself and you introduced me as a new optimist, uh -huh. uh, I'm not naive. You know, I'm rather uh -huh. a euro realist uh -huh. uh, rather than a euro optimist, and this is this is a problem. Uh, <coughs> but I always say, uh, how is the United States behaving? Is it is it any better? Of course not. I don't think so. Hmm. Uh, so uh, we all, as a humankind, and the, 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 the developing and the developed world, got into this. Uh, that you know, uh, culture, which I myself consider bad. Uh, I hate uh, loans and debts. I, 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 I set up my own company without loans. Yeah. Uh, I never took a single crown of state aid. I simply hate it. So when I see what's going on on the, on the national and international level when it comes to, uh, to debts, uh, I, uh, it makes me very nervous. Mm. It makes me very nervous. But uh, that's the reality of life. United States is, is doing it. EU is, but is doing it. Don't you it. think it's good to have the Czech crown in the background so you can adjust to mm -hmm. whatever happens? And, and going back to the euro, what, what's currency nowadays? It's not a, there's no golden standard. It's just trust. Yeah, uh, no, it is. And yeah. uh, despite what's going on, and, and your colleague dis described it well, uh, in the eurozone and in the EU in general, <coughs> EU is, uh, is, is, is the second uh, or the third biggest you know, economic uh, union in the world. And it, 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 th therefore it, it has a trust. It has a trust. It has Germany, you know, it, it has other economies that are functioning Obviously, well. but there's all limits to everything, you know. There, there is this too big to fail has exactly. proven many exactly. times that doesn't work. I think it, it, it will work I in this, so in this case, yeah. but we, we cannot take it for granted that it, it will be always like that and we can, uh, we can get as many loans as possible, never, never paying it back, etc. So I really care about, about reforms in, member, in mem member states. I wish the EU was uh, tougher on member states, demanding their structural reforms like healthcare reform, pension reform, etc. And I wish Europe did more for the competitiveness of its own member states and uh, itself than it's doing at the moment, you know. Yeah, no. But for that, I think we need more integration and we, we need more sovereignty on the, on the above nation states, mm -hmm. the commission, you know, etc. Because I see that uh, there should be really, really more pressure on member states from the center to reform themselves and to do what's necessary for the economy. Because, uh, you know, the specific example, internal market, getting rid of, uh, of barriers on the internal market. Do you think that member states will do it voluntarily? Of course not. France will be still trying to protect uh, through different yeah. non-tariff barriers its own, uh, its own market, etc., uh, etc. Et so that's why we need European Commission as a champion of free trade, really pushing the member states 
uh, to get rid of non tariff <coughs> barriers and liberalize the internal market. Because for me, internal market you know, is, is the most precious and valuable invention of the EU integration. And I really think that you have to push for the liberalization from the top because it will not come from the member states. No, I don't. I don't think so either. So I don't know how we are on time. It says uh, three o'clock here. And uh, I would just like to thank you, Radek, for uh, coming. It's been highly interesting. I hope everybody who watched it has enjoyed it half as much as I did. And uh, I look forward uh, to see you again somewhere, either in my restaurant or in our favorite uh, beer hall. We're not telling where that is. And uh, Come on, it's blue light. <laughs> okay, it's blue it's light. Blue, okay, okay. It's blue light. Okay, Radek. Thanks yes, a million. Thank you very much. And it was great to see you. Yeah, all the best. Take care. Thank you. And everybody, hope to see you soon back again. Thanks.